Hello, I'm Dr. Martin Moreed, and I'm excited to share with you today some research that we're just publishing in the Journal of Biological Rhythms. My team at Circadian Zirclite has identified for the first time a narrow blue band of wavelengths, so-called circadian blue, which synchronizes our circadian clocks. And when incorporated into lights, enables us to deliver lighting that's safe for today's world. Now, blue light is already well established, and you're probably already aware, as a public health hazard when we're exposed to it at night. Any type of blue-rich lighting, whether it's LEDs or fluorescence during the nighttime hours, is associated with obesity and diabetes, sleep disorders, mood disorders, and even certain types of cancer, such as breast cancer and prostate cancer. But blue light is not always the villain. It's also the hero too, because during the daytime hours, blue light is critical to ensuring our circadian rhythms are synchronized, it enables us to sleep well at night, and also it enables our immune system to be as strong as it can be, which is so critical in today's world. However, there was a fundamental question that had not been answered about blue light. What are the precise wavelengths that we need to control to ensure that we have lighting that is healthy and safe? Now, that simple question has actually had a lot of confusion around it. There are different models out there, circadian stimulus model, equivalent Menonopic Lux model, the CIE 2018 standard, all talking about different versions of what the spectrum is that needs to be controlled. And to add to the confusion, various manufacturers are presenting products which are said to control blue with defining different ranges of spectrum of blue in their particular um, model features. So all that was a matter of such confusion that we decided we better delve into this and figure out what was going on. And what we discovered was rather interesting. What we discovered is the core research that all these models were based on was research that was done in the dark. This was with dark adapted subjects or dark adapted isolated retina or even the melanopsin or pigment all studied in the dark and then exposed to short monochromatic, that single color lights for short periods of time to look at the response. None of it was done in the conditions of the real world. And that is what we've set out to do and what we're able to report in this paper. To understand this discovery, we need to talk a bit more about the science. Back in 1980, when I led the team at Harvard Medical School that located the circadian clock in the human brain, the so-called suprachiasmatic nucleus, we knew that it was synchronized by light falling on the eyes and then being passed as a signal up to the circadian clock. What we did not know was the color of light that was responsible. Then in 2001, two groups of investigators, one at the Thomas Jefferson University in the US, the other at the University of Surrey in the UK, made a breakthrough discovery. They discovered that it was primarily short wavelength light, the violet, blue, green part of the spectrum that was responsible for the signal. What they did is they studied people who were in the dark. They were blindfolded, they were in there for a period of time, often up to two hours before the blind walls were removed, and then for a short period of time, up 30 minutes, up to 90 minutes, single color lights, so-called monochromatic lights, were shone on their eyes, and the responses in terms of melatonin were observed. That research, in essentially a dark adapted state, is what has been the basis for circadian models, such as the circadian stimulus model. Other models, such as the equivalent melanopic lux model, or the melanopic irradiance that's used in the CIE 2018 standard, are based on studies in isolated retina and in photopigment studies and isolated photopigment. And those studies are also performed in the dark with short exposures to monochromatic single color lights. To understand this a bit more, uh, let's look at how the retina is organized. The light that is detected as a circadian signal is not detected by the cones that are involved in color vision, nor by the rods that are involved in our vision in dim light, but instead by a special group of retinal ganglion cells with the long name 
They're called the intrinsically photoreceptive retinal ganglion cells, or IPRGCs. And they contain the photopigment melanopsin, which has a peak sensitivity at 479 nanometers in the blue area of the light spectrum. When researchers at the University of Manchester wanted to study how this photopigment melanopsin would respond to light, they couldn't get enough human melanopsin samples from the pathology lab. So what they did is some rather elegant engineering. They created genetically modified human embryonic kidney cells, a standard tissue culture, in a dish in the dark. And then they exposed that dish of these cells to brief camera flashes of monochromatic light. In other words, they looked at the different colors of the spectrum, the reds, the blues, the greens, the yellows independently, and then they measured the response of the cell to a very short signal, which was how calcium moved in the cell over the first one minute after exposure to the light. Now, to get to a model that they viewed as potentially being applicable to the real world, they added some filtering functions and so forth. But the fundamental research is not based on the real world application. So it really is elegant science that these various models have been based on, but not under real world conditions. The problems with these models from in the dark adapted eye become readily apparent when you look at people who are fully light adapted because they've been in light for some hours. During the first few minutes when you awake and you, someone turns on the lights in the darkened bedroom, you're blinded by the light because your eyes are adjusting gradually to that light. That's moving from the dark adapted to the light adapted state. During the first 30 minutes, you're very sensitive to a broad array of lights, uh, to violet, to green and blue, uh, and they all trigger the circadian system. But as people started to look at longer exposures going out for three hours, six hours, 12 hours, what we see is that the green light effect dissipates, no longer has effect on the circadian clock. The violet light dissipates, and we're left with a pure blue signal that keeps on being sustained for as long as the lights are on. So that tells us that those parts of the spectrum that are either side of the blue, the violet and the green, are actually not critical in the light adapted state. Based on some elegant work in the retina, we now understand what's going on. The retinal ganglion cells are detecting blue light with the photopigment melanopsin, but they're also getting inputs from two types of cones, from the S cones that detect violet light and from the M cones that detect green light. And those cones feed their signal into the melanopic IPRGCs so that you get this broad response in the dark adapted state. But as we get light adapted, these cone effects fade away. And the only signal that's seen by the circadian clock is the pure blue signal that's derived from the melanopsic retinal ganglion cells. So what was vitally needed was to measure the circadian response under conditions that are normal to the workplace or school or home and do it with regular polychromatic white light, normal white light, do it with light intensities that were typical from anything from 200 lux to 1000 lux, to look at uh, people who are freely moving and not restrained, to look at them being exposed to light for the normal lengths of time, eight or 12 or more hours at a time, and above all, to use a measurement that was health related. And the key measurement we picked was the overall total production of melatonin over the course of a night, because that is highly correlated to the risk of breast cancer, diabetes, prostate cancer, mood disorders, a whole variety of problems that are result of circadian disruption. In our studies, we used a very interesting feature of white light. It's made of a rainbow mix of colors, but you can achieve white light with very different combinations of those colors. That enables us to select seven different light fixtures. Some were LEDs, some were fluorescents. And we were able to have them all light the same conference room, provide the same level of lighting, uh, which was 50 foot candles, 540 lux, normal conference room lighting levels. 
and then bring in, in the National Institutes of Health grant, a total of 34 people under the different lighting conditions. They were both men and women. They were the same people being exposed to different lights, but under the same light intensity. And we found some very interesting findings. We found some of those lights were highly suppressive of melatonin, whereas other lights allowed melatonin to rise to its normal levels. That enabled us to dissect out what was in fact the key wavelengths that the system is responding to, the circadian system is responding to in regular light adapted conditions. Because these people were exposed to a continuous 12 hours of light. So when we analyzed all these different light spectra and the patterns of melatonin each of them produced, we were able to tease out and identify for the first time the color of circadian blue light. Circadian blue light has a peak wavelength at 477 nanometers, and it's a relatively narrow, sharp peak, so the half maximum effects are obtained at 438 to 493 nanometers in the blue. It has very little in the way of violet or green components to it. This circadian blue light is also happens to be the light that we know is sensed by melanopsin because the peak sensitivity of melanopsin is about 479, very close to the circadian blue light. And interestingly, it is also a color that's great significance in nature. Circadian blue light is the color of the clear blue sky. That's around 476 by independent measurement. It is also the only color that penetrates the ocean depths. We know that all the other colors of the rainbow are absorbed by seawater, so only circadian blue will get below 200 meters in depth. So circadian blue is the first color and the only color that triggered the day-night awareness of the life as it began. It is engineered into our genetics. It is part of who we are and part of all life forms. And that circadian blue is what we need to engineer into the light fixtures and light bulbs of today. Now that we've identified circadian blue, the precise wavelengths of light that stimulate the circadian system, we have the key to unlocking the door to circadian lighting. We can build LED chips, light fixtures, light bulbs, which automatically, during the daytime hours, strengthen our circadian rhythms, providing circadian blue-rich light. And during the evening and night, protect us from the harmful effects of light at night by removing the circadian blue stimulus. What we've done, therefore, is pave the way to engineering light for human health and well-being.